Just want to make sure it's still morning. So good morning, everyone. It's great to be back at All Nations Church. Um, always excited to be here. We've had a long relationship way back when it was called Airedale Church. I mean, that's how... That's either how old I am or how long the building has been here. You could you could pick that. Um, and of course, uh, gosh, I remember doing a Genesis factor here when when George Jarvis was pastor. That's that's how long this goes back. Then of course, Pastor Jeff and I we go well we go back before here, back when Jeff was in Coventry, back when the dinosaurs roamed the earth. Uh, so it goes back quite a ways, and it's been. It's been great to be with you um, over the last several days. Uh, Jeff and I are going to have some time later today and tomorrow, but I also got to spend some wonderful time with Moz and the leadership uh, as well. I'm excited about change and transition. I think this can be a really exciting time for you um, and a great future. Having said that, I would like to talk to you a little bit about something that's been brewing in my heart since I arrived here in the UK. Uh, it's kind of crazy. I got here... Uh, I think it was a, a Friday, and I was with, actually, where Pastor Jeff used to be, now called Hope Springs Church with uh, Steve and Susie Elton, and we began talking about some things, and he said something that sparked something in my mind, which was this phrase, opening our eyes to the table. And I call, then I say, so-called, quote-unquote, spiritual warfare from a Christ-centered view. I think you probably are aware um, I don't know exactly all the teachings that you've had here, but I know Jeff enough and I began to learn enough from Moss that kind of getting devil-focused and Satan-focused and enemy-focused is not necessarily where you like to live, right? But for most of us in Christendom, there's always an enemy out there that's trying to attack us. We always got to overcome. We got to fight the devil, all those kinds of things. And I want to suggest to you maybe... There's another way to go about facing some of that stuff. And so that's what I want to share with you today. Maybe, if you want to call it spiritual warfare, maybe spiritual warfare from a different point of view. With that, I want to share with you this verse. We all know it. Psalms 23, 5. You prepare a table before me in the presence of my enemies. How many of us have read that verse and think, ha ha, that's right, I have a table, I sit with Jesus, and all my enemies are there, kind of looks like this, right? Kind of looks like this, and all the enemies are around us, and they're screaming and yelling at me, etc., and they're going to attack, and they want to bring me down, but I got Jesus at my table, and he prepared that table, and ha ha ha, I'm the devil because of that, you know. Haven't we felt that way maybe sometimes, or maybe we were taught that? I, I don't think you were taught that here, just say it, but I'm sure you've heard that. With that comes another one, and I put the little smiley faces because I really wasn't interested in sharing the minister who was doing the message, but I was trying to just point out that um, folks do have this point of view, and maybe you've heard this when you're watching maybe some <coughs> Christian television. <coughs> okay. The name of this message was, Don't Give the Enemy a Seat at Your Table. What if I suggest to you, that's the absolute wrong approach in Christ? What if there's a whole different approach to this whole thing? So I'd like to suggest that if we interpret from the standpoint of good versus evil, right versus wrong, which creates an us and them mindset, we'll always have an enemy. We'll always have a spiritual enemy, even physical enemies, people who are against us. And what I'm going to suggest to you is, first of all, the first secret to this is getting free of this mindset. Those of you who have heard my teaching before, been around it before, you've been through Genesis Factor, I know I've done one or two of those here at All Nations as well, you know my point of view of how what we commonly call the fall occurred, which we're going to talk about also, again, just as a refresher, just in case you haven't heard that before, or those of you watching on video, maybe you haven't heard that before, so I'm going to rehash that just a bit. 
The thing is, is with the standpoint of the serpent's tree, the knowledge of good and evil, right and wrong, us and them, heroes and enemies, it is born out of that thinking, what we commonly call the fall. But what we're looking for is a greater, if you will, apocalypse, a greater revelation of the Christ. So what I want to do is actually use the Old Testament for a little bit, which you may think is kind of crazy because the Old Testament seems to have good guys and bad guys fighting each other all the time. But many times it's laced with ideas that the apostles extract, extracted ideas from that helped create some of the parameters of the Christ revealed in the New Testament. With that in mind, here's a famous verse of scripture we probably have all heard at one time or another if you've been in Christendom for a while. 2 Kings 6, 12 through 23. It goes like this. And one of his servants said, None, my lord, but O king... Well, let me, let me preface by saying, okay, the king of Assyria has been trying to invade Israel for a while. And every time he does it, his plans get foiled. So he thinks... There's a traitor amongst the armies of Syria. And the question came up at this point, so who's the traitor? We're going to find out. And the response of one of his servants was, there aren't any, my lord, O king, but Elisha the prophet who is in Israel tells the king of Israel the words that you speak in your bedroom. I'd be very curious to hear what some of that conversation is like, but that's for another, another message another time. So he said, go and see where he is, that I might send and get him. And it was told him, saying, surely he's in Dothan. Therefore he sent horses and chariots and a great army there, and they came by night and surrounded the city. And when the servant of the man of God rose early and went out, there was an army surrounding the city with horses and chariots. And the servant, that's Gehazi, I put the brackets in there, the servant Gehazi said to him, Alas, my master, what shall we do? You've probably heard this story before. Now, before we get started, I want to suggest a couple of things. There is this aspect in the garden, which I call the seedbed of all revelation. It's how we perceive chapters 1, 2, and 3 of the garden will define many times how we're going to look at the rest of the Bible. Because even Jesus refers to the garden in certain ways. The catch is this. There were two trees in the garden. One is called the tree of life, the other called the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. The tree of life is a singularity. It only perceives from one dimension. It is non-dualistic. The tree of knowledge of good and evil is dualistic. Good and evil, right and wrong. Okay? And what's interesting about that, because it's ego-based, self-centered based, good and evil is always on a sliding scale, all depending upon who is perceiving it. So you could have one guy calling something good, another guy calling something good, and actually it brings them to a battle and a fight because they think the other guy's evil. Make sense? We've all seen it happen before. In a tree of life mentality, it doesn't even think on terms of good and evil, right and wrong, which is very hard for us to grasp because we live in the system of good and evil. This is why Jesus says things like, I'm from above, you're from beneath. Because the world above only thinks on terms of life. It doesn't think in terms of dualism. We have a propensity to take life-giving things and putting it into a dualistic binary way of thinking, and we kind of dilute that with what that actually means. With that, I'm saying that because of where this will go. First of all, what I want to point out is the word Gehazi, or Gehazi as we like to say in English. The first word, it's a two, two Hebrew words put together. Gehazi, Ge is valley. I put of my God, but that's not necessarily the case. It's just, let's it's really the valley. And then you have heze, which is to perceive contemplatively. So it's the valley where God would open to us the perception 
where we can com contemplatively see. Tracking with me so far. So the very guy who's having the challenge of seeing what's really going on was destined to see something in this valley, but it would require a contemplative perception, not just seeing with the eyes. The next word is Elisha. Elisha, Eli, is the first word. Eli means my strength. For the record, there's no real word God in the Old Testament. It's an adaptation, really because of the Septuagint, that we use this word God. But actually, it's Eli, my strength, or the source of all strength, which we term as God. But the source of my strength, and believe it or not, the latter part of his name is Yeshua, which is freedom, the name of Jesus. Now, Yeshua, we use many times as the word deliverer, but it's really the product of deliverance, which is freedom. So we now have my strength is freedom. We have a guy that is supposed to see in the valley, but do it contemplatively. And then we have... Yisrael, Yeshar-el, two Hebrew words also, which means, Yeshar, to persevere in going straight toward a, a goal. And it's El is where they're going to, which is that source of strength, what we translate as God. So you could say, we have a guy in a valley that's supposed to perceive contemplatively, and what is supposed to open it for him is the strength or the source of total freedom and the way to do it is to go straight to God. So, so good so far? Then we have this word, dothan. Dothan is Aramaic and it means duality. So now we have the picture made for us. Surely he's in dothan, it says. He's in a place of duality. Well, actually, that is true. Everybody is in a place of duality except for one guy, Elisha, the God of freedom. The God of freedom doesn't live in a land of duality. Make sense? Okay, with that, the key phrase is go and see. Go and see. I'm going to suggest to you, actually this entire chapter, but specifically, is all about how you see something. What are the filters that we use to perceive? The secret for Gehazi is going to be removing the filters. The secret to the army of the Syrians is going to be removing the filters. And even the secret to the king of Israel, those who were supposed to go straight to God, really weren't going straight to God, though they thought they were standing with God. How do we see? Jesus said that he has come to give divine absolute life. We know that in John 10.10. 10. In the Father, as revealed in Jesus the Christ, there isn't right and wrong, good and evil, as we perceive it. Rather, there is distinct, the distinction of life and death. Death as defined as the knowledge of good and evil in Genesis 2.17. Let me rehearse that for you real quick, just to refresh your memory. The man and the woman, both called Adam. She's not Eve yet. They are Adam. She doesn't get her name till after the fall. They are in this garden... And they come by this tree that has a serpent in it as the, the myth goes. And I'm using the word myth in a, in a pure sense, not as in a negative sense. Okay, as the story goes. And the serpent says, did God say that you can eat of all the trees of the garden? And right away the woman says, no. God says we can eat all the trees except this one. And the serpent says... Why? And she says, well, if the day that we eat this, we shall surely die. Keep those words in your mind. The next thing was, the serpent says, 
you shall not die. For God knows that the day that you eat of this tree, your eyes will be opened. Keep in mind, we're talking about seeing. Your eyes will be opened knowing good and evil. Remember that? A couple of things to think about. First of all, when they come to the serpent, when he says to them, you shall not surely die, death is being defined in this verse. The biblical definition of death and everything that follows is being defined right here. You shall not surely die, for God does know. Now, the serpent is saying, for God does know. The implication is that uh, there is, I know something about God you don't know. You didn't know this, but I know this. Now, last I checked, was or wasn't the Adam, the Isha and Isha, man and woman, were or were they not made in the image and likeness of God? Okay, so they're already the image and likeness of God. So now moves to the second part is, I know something about God that you don't know. And the next step of that is, what I know is this, that God has been holding out on you. He didn't tell you about this tree that you have to have to be like him. You've been thinking you're like him, but without this, never going to be like him. You have to have this. You've got to know this. And the fall really is not eating the proverbial apple, and the apple's gotten a bum rap for all this time. But, I just realized when I said bum rap, does that mean something different in British? Because I said bum, because in America, bum rap means a bad rap. I'm not meeting a butt rap, but they definitely got kicked out on their butts anyway, right? So I guess it works. Having said this, <clears throat> what happens next is rather important because when they, because he's with her and he receives this as well, let's not get into all that for a minute. When they reach for the tree, the metaphor of egoistic knowing good and evil, when they do that is the moment they fell. Why? Because they no longer believed they were like God enough. They no longer believed and accepted the reality that I'm the image and likeness of God. I needed something more. Living in death is believing you're not like God enough and need something more. Period. What Jesus really came to do is to show us you don't need anything more. You already have it all. Let me show you by my example what that looks like. Right? Jesus is not an example for us. He's an example of us. Okay. With that, then, understanding that, in the end, death is only the absence of life. Why? Because the Hebrew word for tree, apes, means to close the eyes. So even though the serpent is saying, your eyes will be open, what he's not telling you is, yes, your eyes will be open to the knowledge of good and evil, but you're going to close your eyes to life. And you can't live in both spaces. You're going to, in every moment of our lives, we're still having to choose what gives life or what's right. And many times they're not the same. Death is only the absence of life. And when life is unveiled, death, the knowledge of good and evil, no longer exists. As the Apostle Paul says, barring from Isaiah 20, uh, 25, 8, death is swallowed up in uh, Netzach, which is perpetual splendor. Death is swallowed up by life. The knowledge of good and evil is swallowed up because I, I now operate from something of a whole new different idea, a whole different space, a whole different source. So he answered, do not fear, this is Elisha speaking to Gehazi, do not fear, for those who are with us are more than those who are with them. And Elisha prayed and said, Lord, I pray, open his eyes that they may see. Then the Lord opened the eyes of the young man and he saw. And behold, a mountain was full of horses and chariots of fire all around Elisha. So when the Assyrians came down to them, Elisha prayed to the Lord and said, strike this people, I pray, with blindness. And he struck them with blindness according to the word of Elisha. Consider... 
Open his eyes, he said. Here again, we're about seeing. And what's the other point? Blindness, not seeing. I'm going to suggest to you that the blindness here and the opened eyes are almost synonymous. That sounds crazy. But I'll prove to you what I mean in a minute. The issue at hand is do I see from a standpoint of life or do I see in duality, which is blindness? So we're talking about dualism or life. Let me give you an example. This is one of the craziest verses to me in the New Testament. Check this verse out. John 9, 39 through 41. And Jesus said, For judgment I've come into this world. Aha! That those who do not see may see. Sounds like a hazai. And that those who see might be made blind. Ha ha! Like the Assyrians. Then some of the Pharisees, a.k.a. like the Syrians, who were with him heard these words and said to him, Are we blind also? And Jesus said to him, I can move out the way so you can see this with me. Look at this. If you were blind, you would have no sin. Ruminate on that for a little bit. But now you say we see, therefore your sin remains. Hmm. If you're blind to the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, there is no sin. But because you, we think we see based on right and wrong, good and evil, our sin remains. And what's the sin? By definition, sin could be several different things, but probably the most rudimentally is hamaratano in Greek, which basically means that which no longer has form. I've lost my sense of form. The tree of the knowledge of good and evil is a false form. It's an illusion. True form comes from life. So the secret now is going to be <clears throat> if I was blind, I would have no sin. So it's about me shutting my eyes to the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, which awakens my eyes to the tree of life. Now Elisha said to them, This is not the way, nor is this the city. Follow me and I'll bring you to the man whom you seek. Now, who is the man they're seeking? Elisha. But they have not yet experienced the source of freedom yet. The Assyrians are technically blind. Gehazi is supposed to be seeing. But we have not yet approached Israel, which means to go straight to God and see it the way God sees this whole thing. So it was when they had came to Samaria that Elisha said, Lord, open the eyes of these men that they may see. And the Lord opened their eyes and they saw that they were inside Samaria. Now when the king of Israel, the guy who was supposed to be going straight to God, saw them, he said to Elijah, my father, shall I kill him? Shall I kill him? What's wrong with this picture? Again, open the eyes. And when the king of Israel saw, but what were they seeing? They were seeing from a world of duality still. Then Elisha's about to do something, and you'll see a great shift take place. Here it is. Duality is gone. Life is present. But he answered, you shall not kill them. Would you kill them who you've taken captive with your sword and your bow? Set food, or literally bread, and water before them that they may eat and drink and go to their master. Wait, eat and drink and go to their master? But something happens now here. The one who's supposed to go straight to God gets it. Now that Elisha, the source of freedom, has spoken, then he prepared a great feast for them. 
This wasn't just bread or water. This was party time. Consider this. And he sent them away. Now, I don't know if you saw at the bottom where I had the word life. It's now changed into the Hebrew word, vayashalechem. And vayashalecha means, and he sent them away. So consider, he prepared a great feast for them. Now, what doesn't appear to be on the surface, as always Hebrew does, doesn't always appear on the surface, but the great feast is on a table. And after they ate and drank, he sent them, vayashalechem, and they went to their master. So the bands of the Assyrian raiders came no more into the land of Israel. Why? They were not enemies anymore. Doesn't mean that the Assyrian king is still not going to have problems with Israel, and that problems won't continue. But something happened here. And this is the point. Via Shalechem, send them away. If you look at the word, you're going to find this word change real quick into this. Shalechin, which is the word for table. You prepare a table. Shalechin, shalechem. It's the idea of this. What I set at the table and what you eat is what I send you away with. Make sense? Now let's go further. That Hebrew word here, if you can see where my pen is, shalechin. If I was to draw a line right between these two words, I would have shell, which means to place or to put something. And then I would have heen. And heen is the Hebrew word for grace. What am I putting on the table? If I put grace on the table, which usurps anything about right, wrong, good, and evil. I send who were thought to be my enemies, away with life-giving grace. So consider this verse. You prepare a table. Shelchin, the placing of grace and the sending forth of grace. Jesus said in that famous segment where there was going to be a wedding feast. Remember? And he said, invite these people. Here's the, here's the guest list. And he goes to one and they have an excuse. Goes to another, they have an excuse. He goes to another, they have an excuse. Now watch what happens at this wedding feast again where a table is placed. So the servants went out into the highways and gathered together all whom they found both bad and good. There was no distinction between right and wrong, good or evil here. It wasn't like the, only the good people get to sit at this table, but the bad people get to sit at this table too. Why? Because God doesn't think on those terms. Do you know how many church squabbles would be resolved if we just lived the life of Christ? Do you realize how many Times we wouldn't get, especially in our country, involved into political messes if we're not operating by right and wrong, good and evil. I mean, at, at our, in our country, my wife and I were at a pastor's meeting some, uh, about two years ago, three years ago, and in our country we have what's called Republicans and Democrats. I believe you guys call them conservatives and liberals, or the Labor Party. Is that, that how that works? <coughs> and the, the, the minister was supposed to be speaking about how to persevere in ministry when things get hard. Well, he lasted 10 minutes on that topic, and then he went right to the politics. And there was a diverse group of people here, not to mention there was waiters and, and, and uh, uh, servants that, you know, that were, were waiting on the tables. We don't know what their political backgrounds were or anything. And here's the Christian speaker. And he says this word, these phrases, I don't call them Democrats anymore, I call them Democrats. Good and evil, right and wrong. I promise you that was not life-giving. 
what was really sad was about two to three quarters of that group went cheered that. My wife was in tears at that point. No kidding. And if we weren't sitting where we were sitting, she would have got up and left. But physically, we couldn't get past the stage. We'd have to walk across the stage in order to leave. That would have made a statement, huh? But we didn't want to do that either. Both bad and good. See, this is not about letting go of the bad and being nice. This is about seeing in a whole different dimension. And I'm going to tell you in a short word, one key word that will get you to start seeing from that realm. And it's not studying your Bible. You cannot study your Bible past this one word. Let me put it this way. We might, many times we say, God gave me a revelation. I'm sure he did. But if our lens is still wrapped up in right and wrong, good and evil, eventually the revelation we'll have will turn into that. Which is called a descent. And if we're supposed to be seated already in heavenly places in Christ, when we do that and we descend, we're no longer naming Christ from above, but we're doing it from below. Make sense? How about this verse? Jesus says, But I say to you, love your enemies... Bless those who curse you, do good to those that hate you, pray for those who spitefully use you and persecute you, that you may be sons of your Father in heaven. Darn! <laughs> I mean, think, think of this. Ver- how, many, how many of us, I mean, what I call, are become literalists? We ha- the Bible says. You ever hear that? The Bible says. Okay, let me, let me, let me here's my point. We read about a serpent in a tree that talks. We're good with that. We read about in Genesis 6 about angels that come down and have sex with mortal women. As a result, they have giants. We're good with that. Sure. But right up until Jesus says, love your enemies, now we have to qualify it. Now, all of a sudden, we're no longer in the boat of, of just believing the Bible. Now it's, well, but if they're a Democrat, well, if they don't speak in tongues, well, if they do speak in tongues, you know what I mean? You understand. Here's the key. When Jesus said, love your enemies, you know what that equals? If you were to make a mathematical equation out of it, Love your enemies equals you don't have any. You say, but they may be against me. That's their point of view. That doesn't have to be yours. Jesus hanging on the cross. Father, forgive them. They don't know what they're doing. I would have been like, hold it. They plotted. They paid the guy. He got the army that came to get you, smacked you in the face, took you in, beat the tar out of you over and over again. The Pharisees then were, were told they could take the money back because he felt bad, and they were like, I don't, we can't use this. This is blood money now. How could you say they don't know what they're doing? Because from a tree of life perspective, they're unconscious. As far as God is concerned, they didn't know what they were doing. Regardless how hard they planned, how hard they plotted, the bottom line was they don't know what they're doing. Now here's the real key thing. When you hear the phrase, Father, forgive them, they don't know what they're doing, the next time you mess up, apply it to yourself. You got unconscious for a minute. And you did something stupid. Or worse, you did the right thing. But in God's economy, it was still unconscious. Consider what happens after that. I won't put up the verse because I want to be honorable as close as I can to be to my time. But 
the next segment of, of these verses is when he says, be sons of your father in heaven, he was clearly saying that the other is not your son, is not a son of the father. This is why he said to the fathers, you're a, your father the devil. That didn't go over well. That's kind of like, Jesus, can you be a little bit more politically correct? Because it's going to get you crucified. But let me throw out this idea of what the devil is before we start talking to so-called spirits in the air. Dia means through. Bolos means fall. The diabolos is that which came through the fall. So before we start talking about evil spirits and all that stuff, may I suggest to you, the most evil spirit you may have to contend, contend with is your own ego. It's true. Consider this verse, right? Here's, here's Peter. They're talking with Jesus. Oh, some say you're, you're this prophet. Some say you're Elijah back again. And Jesus says, who do you say that I am? And Peter goes, you're the Christ, the son of the living God. And Jesus says, you didn't get that from men. But you got it from my Father in heaven. You ascended, Peter. For a moment in your life, you saw something that was powerful. Now, before I get to the next part, let me fast forward. Then you see Jesus on the Mount of Transfiguration. Remember, hold that. It's a nice, religiously beautiful statement, right? The title. You see it in your Bible, Mount of Transfiguration. Basically, what it is is Jesus goes up the hill, takes Peter, James, and John with him, and all of a sudden, he's transformed before their eyes, right? And they see him talking with Elijah and, and with Moses. And you think, wow, Jesus transform, transformed. I'm going to suggest to you, Jesus never changed. Their perspective did. Jesus was just being Jesus. Communing in a spiritual dynamic of life that they caught for a moment. And unfortunately, our good friend Peter realizes, wow, this is really cool. We should build a temple here. It says a tabernacle. And then the father breaks through and says, no, this is my, my beloved son. Hear him. Subtle, subtlety is, stop looking at Moses. Stop looking at Elijah. Focus on him. Now let me go backtrack again. So Peter has this moment of revelation. You're the Christ, the Son of the living God. You don't get five to seven verses later where Peter now hears from the Christ part of the plan, which is that he's going to be suffering of death at the hands of the Pharisees and the pagans. And Peter says, no way, Lord, not going to happen. And Jesus says, get behind me, Satan, for you don't speak the things of God, but, and you'll stop there for a minute. All of a sudden, first of all, Peter went from glorious revelation to now being called Satan. In seven, five to seven verses. May I suggest to you, we can do that too. And we're so thrilled that we got one revelation. Now I'm speaking out of a completely different place we won't mention in church. The thing that always struck me about that verse, who really got insulted? If, if one believes that Satan is some kind of external being, then I would suggest he got insulted. Because he didn't say the way we read it, get behind me, Peter, you speak the things, you don't speak the things of God, but of Satan. He didn't say that. Peter, get behind me. You don't speak the things of God, but the, the things of the devil. No, what he said was, get behind me, Satan, you don't speak the things of God, but the things of man. Now, if you believe in a literal devil, that poor devil just got insulted because he talks like us. <laughs> oh, was he really making another point? That Peter, the revelatory guy, just simply became adverse to the very revelation he had because he now went back to his old right and wrong thinking 
and duality settled in. And what was once a revelation toward God now becomes adverse to God. What does that mean? The idea of love your enemies, equaling, you don't have any. That means if you love someone, it doesn't matter how they perceive you. It's about how your inner life perceives them. Sure, those that like you compared to those that hate you will interact differently with them on occasion. One will kiss you on the cheek. The other one will slap you on the cheek. And if they're really devious, like Judas, they'll kiss you on the sleep while they're slapping you. But here's the thing. Jesus wasn't judging that. He let both, or technically all three happen. And didn't phase, get phased at all about where they were coming from. In the mind of Christ, it's the same. I love you. I don't designate you as an enemy because I would then be stuck in serpentine dualism. I simply see you from the standpoint of divine life, light, and love. You're the one that I love. Let's sit and dine together at the table, at the wedding feast, and let me send you off with the grace I want to pour into you. Let me bless you with the grace on this table because it's not about God putting a table in the presence of my enemies to distinguish whose side God is on, but to transform my perception and theirs that we can dine together and experience this love with one for another. May not mean that, like in the Assyrian case, we're going to be friends forever. The Assyrians went back to where they came from. But it said they didn't trouble them anymore. Because everybody saw differently. And with that, I leave it to you. Miles. Thanks, John. Just stay there for a moment, please. Um, fantastic, as, as as always. Um, one of the things we were we've been has been on my heart, and we've been discussing this weekend is there's a lot of there's a lot of stuff out there on on the TV, on the internet that that pretends to be Christian. That, that these um, and John alluded to some of that this morning, and it, it can be very easy to fill our hearts with with that sort of stuff, which quite a lot of it is complete rubbish, in my opinion. And um, well, while I was listening to that, I thought, there's an alternative here, because, John, you have a um, you have a, a digital church, you call it, don't you, where we can access some more of your teaching and things through there. And can I suggest that maybe if you have a subscription to, um, I'm not going to name any networks, but you can know what I'm talking about, perhaps that money might be better spent um, First, taking care of your own church. Yes. <laughs> that, that's priority number one before you start spending anything anywhere else. Take care of home. I'm sorry. No, no, home, thank you. But I love your church. <laughs> but um, perhaps you could tell us how we could, how anyone could might get, be able to get involved in that. Um, the time zones are different enough, it wouldn't clash with our meetings here. But Well, in our case, which I, n not, I don't know that it would fit for you, and that's because. I want you to build all nations. When becoming a digital member of Oasis of the Valley basically is as if you didn't have a home church um, and you were looking for, the way it kind of happened to the short version was 
about four or five years ago, somebody kept on, I, I got about three emails in one week saying, do you know a church in my area? One was from Tennessee, another one was from uh, Ohio. Do you know a church in my area that is preaching what you're preaching? And it's like, mm, not really, I don't. <laughs> Actually, I know a handful in the nation that's that's teaching this. It's growing a little bit, but and then you know I wasn't thinking. I just was like I don't know what to do. And then I, the light bulb went off. Well, you're live streaming. Why don't you take it to the next level and say to these people, if you want to join Oasis, I realize you physically couldn't be here, but we, my wife and myself and Pastor Christina would make it our purpose to meet with you via Zoom, maybe once a month or when convenient, once every six weeks, just as you would meet with your pastors, talk, pray together, watch the messages. If you can, watch them live, because when we uh, broadcast live, we do the whole thing with worship and announcements, so just like at a regular church service. But then what we do, so that's the digital membership you're talking about. Then what we do is almost all of our messages then get reproduced fancy name is post-production, um, gets reproduced and then put on the Oasis or Master Giovanni Ministries uh, YouTube channel where you can access all of those. So most all of our messages are there. Uh, then we have some others that, you know, yeah, you can purchase for a download. But most everything that we do, um, whether it's my wife or myself, Karen uh, or Christina, or sometimes uh, we do a thing called the Apostles' Table between me and a fellow named Will Wheat, where we just kind of sit and respond to questions. And during the live transmission, whether you're a member or not, if you jump on the YouTube, you can always ask questions and comment through the YouTube while it's live, and we'll get them, and we respond as well. So as far as getting these teachings, you don't have to be a digital member. Uh, my heart would be support all nations, empower it for the future, keep it moving. You know, if you want to make a donation to Oasis, we'll never say no. But, but we want you to take care of home first. So what would we search for to find all that? Okay, uh, if you were to go to T-O-O-A-S-I-S to Oasis. Com. Just for the game. Sorry. T-O-O-A-S-I-S dot com. That'll take you to Oasis. Or Mastro, M-A-S-T-R-O, M-I-N, Mastromin dot com. That'll take you to my website where it has some other things on it like my books, etc. That's not on Oasis. But the two... We, we, we both work in tandem. The, um, the Mastro Men uh, is more about this traveling element that I do. So it has those types of messages and more along those lines where Oasis would be more what you call your Sunday morning church type experience. There's a lot of rubbish out there. And discerning what is good can be difficult sometimes, but this is good. And let's, um, let's try to get more of that into our lives. Thank you. Um, so...